We always start with the mission statement of the district. I think it's very important to state that we state the mission. Um, it was developed before I got here, but it was developed by the Board of Education, and I think it's a good one. Um, but I should say that the link between the mission and what you're going to hear about tonight, um, maintaining our facilities in good working order, providing a healthy and safe environment uh, for our children, uh, conducive to student learning, is all part of it. So if we are planning for the future, and every decision we're making, all the planning we're doing, is really for at least 10 years down the road. So we're not, we're trying not to make any decisions that are short term, instead of long term. Our fiscal, academic, physical plans, uh, planning, is all kind of intertwined. And the future, of course, is our children. So whenever I make decisions in this role, may sound like pandering, but they are the only reason we are here, and they are the only reason for a project such as this. We have about 1,500 students at this time in the district, and each one gets one shot at 13 years of education. And so we want to make sure that we're upkeeping our facilities, providing the best curriculum, the best teaching staff we can. Slide three, um, for those of you who don't normally focus on this, the board, is maybe fed to the teeth of this, but we have five goals. And these goals direct the objectives that we made at the beginning of the year, the ones we measure at the mid middle of the year. And these enduring goals in front of you, or on your pamphlet, is the whole reason we kind of plan capital projects. I would say that looking at goal five, we plan fiscally hand in hand um, with projects like this so we can maintain the balance when our, what our students need and what our taxpayers can actually afford. Um, something important to keep in mind is goal five. Our taxpayers pay about 8% of any capital project because 92% of what we spend comes back to us in the form of state aid. And that's one important thing to remember. And we're really fortunate in that regard. So our taxpayers bear the cost of roughly 8%, maybe a little less, it's actually Capital projects are critical to our financial welfare as well. We maintain debt, we hold debt, we budget for debt, and we do that routinely, just as you would a mortgage or a car payment. And we do that perpetually because it also has implications for state aid and it has implications for, uh, for other financial pieces of the district. Um, now the EPC, beyond the capital project, um, we'll go into some detail. Not only saves energy costs, it capitalizes on that state aid I was talking about, includes grants, and provides even income to the district, which you know, we don't focus on a lot, but the EPC is a very interesting um, process at the state of office. I want to introduce a few people to you. Um, both many of you know them, but we have our architect here, our main architect, lead architect, and Petrotech, Derek Hammond, who's responsible for the development of the building condition survey which is required by the state of New York every five years. Um, basically, that building condition survey is a document that costs about $40,000. It is aidable, but we're required to do it every five years. We take a look at that document for things that need our attention in capital projects. Um, so Garrett is responsible for specifications for projects, submission to the um, state education department, for review and approval, you prepare documents for bidding purposes in conjunction with the district and construction manager, who's over here to my left. And he certifies contractor payment uh, applications, reviews and recommends change orders for the district, uh, prepares paperwork, etc., etc. We have a construction manager for this main project, uh, Bill Rivers, officially Bill. Well, Bill reviews the scope of work. He works on behalf of the district only, but he works in partnership with all of our other partners to really advocate for the district um, to make sure we're getting what we need. He works with the architect in the, the district to prepare bid documents and supervises construction on site at our schools and monitors the contractor's work, ensures schedule are maintained, etc. We have an energy partner, um, Ian O'Brien, to my left here, 
from Danforth. Um, he's representing a company that will perform an energy performance contract. So they prepared a, a preliminary audit on what they believe we could save, what the projects we believe we could get aided for, and grant money for. Um, so he does the cost analysis to ensure that we're going to become more energy efficient, that we'll save money that way, and also that the work that can be done is also state aidable. So those two things together um, really apply to infrastructure, lighting, a lot of lighting, HVAC, uh, building and work, those sorts of things. So um, a new partnership for the district. I don't think we've done an EPC before, but basically it is a, I don't want to say it's a free project, but the money for that project, and you'll see extensiveness of this comes from energy savings, grants, state aid, and there's even a little bit more which comes back to the district in income. It's kind of a win win for the district. We have financial advisors, I'll just tell you about. We work with Ben Manzone and Mike Schuster from fiscal advisors. We have school attorneys on these projects, Chris and Jeff Honeywell. Um, they're with us for all transactions to do with real estate. Bond Council, we're a bond council, Barbara Damon, Connie Cahill is our person, and of course, uh, to my right, Dave Wood. So most of you know Dave, but Dave is a real treasure for the district. He's, he sees through these capital projects, makes lots of recommendations, and he's kind of the brains behind the assessment, the institutional knowledge of this place, and he's indispensable in this process. So, I don't know what you're at. There's a timeline up here if you look vertically from the top down. So the planning process is basically a two-year process. Um, we had to go into the vision survey, which I think I But the planning, the project planning definition is kind of the area that we're in right now. We're heading into the capital referendum, which is November 15th. Um, the design and documentation comes probably not after. That's where design really gets into the nitty gritty, but remember, we don't spend more than the voters authorize us to spend, and we don't um, do things that we haven't actually in some concept promised the voters. And that's, that's the thing to remember. So the design and documentation, we have to submit this, everything we did to the state ed department. Um, we, have, we go out for bids, we award those bids, contracts, the construction happens, close out the project, it's probably not going to close out for another two years from now. So this whole planning process is quite a bit. Here is just, for your information, I'm not going to read it to you, because in front of you, you have two pages of exact dates and timelines for when things need to happen in these capital projects. I hope that's okay. I'm not going to read it. This stuff. No. Now this is just another visual timeline. So we'll probably post this on our rooms in our, in our, our project offices and make sure that we're staying on target. But it gives us a good, a good reference point. If you look at the top here, the capital project, you can see that construction ends 2025 around April. It's a very long processing concept. And then the energy performance contract um, project is not far behind, but it is also not quick. All takes coordination. Um, so let's go through. Let's go through um, the scopes of work by COVID that we're, we're recommending. Um, I mentioned we have Bill Willard here, construction manager. Ian O'Brien here with the energy performance contract. We have Dave. We have Garrett. We also have in the audience board members who have served on the audit budget finance committee for a couple of years, also on the facilities committee. So the board is intricately involved. Everything you kind of see tonight. There are things, though, in this presentation we presented to the board. Gosh, I think it was August. It was August eighth. Yeah. 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 And they raised questions of the board members, and rightly so. And one of them had to do with this specific room. So you know, we'll we'll show you a little bit about um, that process and how we got to where we are. So Johnson High School will again. 
the site work, drainage, uh, pavement improvements, um, all those things you see under there. A centralized bus group, which will be actually, um, we still need to design that, but we have been using behind the tennis courts for bus pickup and drop off for our one week students. We're actually thinking about an idea of also, uh, depending on how transportation goes, because we know we have a shared decision making uh, model that we're using to decide on the district's direction for transportation in the coming years too. Um, but we are already thinking about pickup and drop off uh, for building configurations. We have the circle out here right now, but we also need to configure this properly to keep from getting cones and you know strains on it right now for safety purposes for drop off. It's just not feasible anymore to drop and pick up kids down at Orange Street. So that's in this project. We also have building envelope, um, attention, foundation, exterior insulation, the EFIS system, which is all that kind of stucco that you see around the building. Um, much of that needs our attention. Instructional space, this room, for example, we, I think at one point, presented a concept that was quite elaborate. But you know, it's, it's keeping everything you see here by replacing the seats. So if you happen to be in a seat with, that looks like my abs or it looks like my, my face, kind of after a, a fight or something, you know, these seats are original to the 1966 photo. And being eight years old, it really would be a good idea to replace these, add some tabletops for instructional space. And all that in the design process, but in concept. Keeping everything really as it is, technology infrastructure, HVAC, air, handling. Behind these two walls are offices that also need attention for air handling. Um, they were never really properly um, or should they? I think. Yes. That's an easy way to say it. Um, of course, the HVAC I mentioned. In our cafeteria, air handlers, the lot larger construction room, which is this one, walk-in freezer replacement. We have some lighting, the theatrical lighting in the Performing Arts Center needs replacement. Um, there are many performances where we're not sure if from one second to the next the lights are going to work. Um, it's, a, it's an antiquated system. LED lighting in the EDC parking lot, keeping the light poles, just changing out the apparatus. Anything anyone wants to say about that? Yeah. You can. This is a little picture which you have in front of you too. A uh, concept picture of this space. You can see it's just largely the same. And I'm not sure if the tables would actually look like that. You know, we have a lot of design work to do. The idea is to make this an instructional space uh, updated with better, better seating, lighting, technology. And here is repaving that parking. This parking you got in front of you. This is parking near the tennis courts. This is in the back of the tennis courts. This is where we're proposing that we solidify the Orange Street uh, busing. Could come, it could become a bus to pick up and drop off for the high school as well. So we also have a bus drop off up here. Um, this is not still Knoxville as well. Um, site work, there's some playground drainage issues that we have to attend to. In the interior, we have asbestos, we have old um, tile, we need to abate and replace that. Server rooms, which is really the balcony area of the auditorium, which has it houses some of our servers for the, district, for the entire district, um, has inadequate air conditioning. Lighting, exterior lighting, we've got our unknowns. The building itself we really need to improve by adding wall caps to the building itself. We're not talking about light poles. We'll, we'll retrofit whatever is around the campus here, putting some uh, you know, what are called wall caps on the exterior. The actual lighting controls, this is really about an antiquated system at Knox. If we're truly going to use this building, um, we need to update it from and you still need to turn on any lights by going through the backstage and it, it just needs to be updated. Those switches are from I don't know, 30s, 40s, 50s. They're still the original switches. You just
just need to update the, the lighting and control systems there. And that's, there's an example of a playground. We have in front of you some drainage issues. You can imagine this is this is um, wood chips. And right now, if that's the technology we're going to use, we might have an opportunity to design something different, but that's not going to be safe. Rotting and decaying you know, surface material. Warm Street. Um, we have a traffic study included in this project for the bus parking and pedestrians walking. Uh, drainage, pavement, walkway renovations between the school buildings, um, designated bus lane with curbs, which I was talking about on the back of the tennis courts here. Building envelope. Um, this is classroom window replacements for all classrooms. Dave, do you want to say anything briefly about the windows? We talked a little bit about them today. Yeah, um, well, they are original to the building. Uh, they're a glass called gray light, which has a laminated film to darken them. Um, some of that film is starting to break down in the once you get into the zoom. Um, they're single pane, they're not energy efficient. And um, on the front side of the building, we like to make it so it's uh, it doesn't heat the classroom as much. So that's a significant cost in this budget. I think the estimate is over five hundred thousand dollars for the replacement of the windows. Um, looking at the building interior, looking at the serving line and kitchen equipment, um, these schools were all built with sandwich and soup. And I won't tell you right now because I used to do that kid when I'm home at lunch. But more than that, we are trying to fit. We're trying to improve quality of time we spend in instruction and the time we spend trying to house kids in the cafeteria with additional kids in this building and just the flow of how that whole cafeteria um, thing works is something we aim to improve through this project. By lightening the serving line, we're looking at taking out the stage area in Warren Street to expand the square this area of the floor and thus open up more Adding lockers for students. Um, if this is going to be a kind of a secondary intermediate building, um, we need to think about lockers because these are the smallest classrooms in the district in Warren Street. And storage at Warren Street is a real problem with other classrooms. And lockers, we have a plan that would add 180 more hours. Um, Stage and mobile, I just talked about. Providing LED lighting in existing parking lot holes or retrofitting those. Here's an example, if you have that in front of you. From left to right, you see we would take out uh, a couple of those walls and make room for those locker um, houses. An example of the windows, lower left, not a great picture, but it gives you an idea just for reference. If you, if you want to know more information, you have to be asking by the building. Um, the serving line is there in the center, and then you can just for your reference, this is what a stage currently looks like. Again, not great pictures, I don't think, but they the stage is not utilized efficiently or effectively. And I don't think it ever can be. Um, so it's all tying into this reconfiguration model that we're about to head into more discussions about. Opening Knox building, reconfiguring a few of our schools. We're looking at Glebe Street as well. Um, interestingly enough, many people feel like we've sold Glebe and we don't own it anymore. It's not the case. So we own Glebe, we take care of the Glebe, we furnish it for custodial care. We have a contract for 10 years with PTEC for Glebe Street. And so Glebe Street is really about building envelopes again, HVAC, server rooms specifically, lighting. Um, we also have deepest repair and reconstruction. You can see in the bottom of the pictures. This is just a breakdown, it's a visible breakdown of that piece of material. Poor design also of the, of the portico. The, the rain actually ends up right on the tops of the towers, of the columns, and uh, we have to aim to fix that. Pleasant Avenue, um, window replacements as well. We have a plan, so Dave, I think we can talk about this. Some windows are already been replaced, 
I don't know if the remainder of the bills. Um, the select bathrooms. There's two areas that we need. Yeah, they can use one. So the building interior, we also have um, flooring that needs to be taken out and replaced. Again, looking at the cafeteria, the way we serve the students in the cafeteria line, offering them choices and um, allowing that flow to happen so we can maximize the time that kids are able to in line, eating, and then back for instruction. HVAC systems, server rooms, lighting, again, mostly a lot of the parking areas. We have lots of complaints that lighting is inadequate in most of our school buildings and parking. You can get a glance at some of the locomotives we have housed in the basement there, part of the avenue, including some of the antique uh, dial. Um, so it's time to replace these. This is evident in the building condition survey. And I don't know if anyone wants to talk about EDPs. Yeah, and all those are new mat controls that are original to the building. Um, the boilers have been replaced previous. They're not original to the building, but they're at the end of life. And we're currently, we've had to buy some replacement coils for the actual classroom new vents because we're getting some erosion in the coils and the coils are starting to fail. And it's really decent piece of equipment. I think the last, when Freedom said part of that cost us from just those coils alone, $6,000. Uh, this year. This year, $6,000. Which is amazing to us that we have to move away from it. So were those coils replaced? Yes, late 80s. Early 90s. So the energy performance contract, this is a very specific um, project that the company works in tandem and in with the capital project that just kind of issued. Not, if you can forgive me, I'm going to say it, the word sexy, there is nothing sexy in this capital project dagger that we just covered. It's a lot of infrastructure, it's a lot of, a lot of lighting, a lot of building out there, some replacement of aging structures. That you see, but a lot that you don't see that will feel comfortable. Uh, energy performance contract Ian is the expert on energy performance contracts. I have been through two of them myself at former districts. I found them to be very beneficial. And the word contracts is important for it here because it is a contract. We cannot lose money on this. We cannot default on this. The company enters into a contract with the school district. It is legal and binding document, we must get state aid, we must seek energy savings, we must, I think, grants will be yeah, yeah. in there yeah. in some way too that will pay for everything so the taxpayers don't shoulder any any money uh, on that project long term. Yeah, I think it's probably saying that the important piece of that too is it's a guaranteed maximum cost and price of the contract here. We're locked in that price and cost and if it doesn't go up with that equipment, but um, being right now is being rolled with this, as well as if we don't meet the same guarantee, um, we also incur that. So there's really no risk in addition to the way we're entering the contract. And an interesting note about the energy performance contract is that while we are aided on capital projects, 92 cents on every dollar, energy performance contracts without a public vote are still possible to go ahead with. But it would be 10% less in state aid. So the reason we take this to vote is to gain that additional aid of the maximum aid we possibly can, 92% of state aid. Otherwise, if we could just do this project without board approval, it would be 82% of that state aid, which isn't smart. Um, so each I go through each building here. Again, you have it in front of you, which I think is hopefully helpful. Um, we're looking at lighting and controls upgrades, some building envelopes in each of our buildings. They're not uh, energy performance contract, ESCO companies don't come in, have contractors replace light fixtures, make them pretty, and that sort of thing. This is all about functionality and energy savings. Um, so if you want to talk about. Yeah, uh, just like on the, the learning environment improvements as far as lighting goes, it's touched on it with the actual lighting as well. So what we look for through the survey of all buildings is uh, what fixtures are in good shape. Um, if there's no plans long term to replace those lighting fixtures, uh, you change the ceiling so you can do a retrofit that with those works. Uh, we're really taking everything out of the bunk itself, including the housing and replacing that light. Uh, really just the best bang for your buck as far as replacement goes. We look at the 
this at, at full, um, full analysis of the writing, so the really anything new is going to be more of a capital project as we saw on some of those slides and not GPC, um, any new writing uh, that's not existing to use it could have been a capital project or if it is existing to use it, it is going to be a GPC. Um, and then uh, those lines are getting into control, it's going to be one of those lines that's going to replace the layer of one machine and control is going to match the whole, whole working system. So up here, before you keep drilling, you're seeing learning environment improvements, which really does come down to the lighting. Um, ventilation improvements, replacement of some air handling units on the rooftops. Uh, I'm going to show you some pictures as well. Uh, air handling units with new controls, mostly this is about controls of these, of these um, pieces of equipment. Building automation controls, uh, a lot of this is out of my, you know, my field house back there. Um, yes, yeah, so obviously air honestly, so temperature controls, just like at your home, you want to make sure they're regularly accurate, regularly scheduled as well. Um, some of the concerns when going through the district and doing our analysis was driving in was on a, a consistent uh, comprehensive system. Uh, so our goal was to work with the district to make sure um, they were providing for the whole working system. One platform rather than a couple of different ones on different architects. Um, that ultimately, in the end, drives uh, energy savings when we're able to do that in an energy project versus a capital project. If you don't mind, just put your note if you have questions on any particular slide. Otherwise, I'm going to go through these because I know the facilities committee was here, the audit budget finance, some people have had this back. So um, here's a picture of the high school. We're looking at the orange on the left. Um, yeah, so um, so the, the far side and the left side, uh, the nine classrooms, uh, that is uh, the multi-zone replacement. Uh, so currently there is a training unit that is uh, serving those spaces uh, and making them on the roof. Uh, we've done our full analysis working with Dr. Beck to, to come up with a uh, adequate equipment selection. It's a custom unit that's required, uh, but it's something that would allow for simultaneous heating and cooling of those spaces as well as controls to um, help pay with uh, the uh, the right schedules for those, those classrooms as well. Uh, the green area will be the AI space that that actually is known as a capital project, um, which you're seeing there now. And then the far uh, right on the corner is a couple of rooftop units that we uh, come up with selections for them to serve a couple of different offices. These are these are areas of focus. These are all areas of focus, and it's really just in a nutshell improving ventilation systems. And here we're going to gloss over these maps quickly. You can see by the colors the different types of controls we use. Um, if it's white, it's um, pneumatic controls. If you want to make analog, and if you look at the red, what is that? Siemens. Uh, that's Johnson's. Johnson's. Okay, Johnson's is what we aim to replace. We're trying to get more um, just one kind of controls for our systems, and that would be to see more orange. Correct. Orange. Upstairs, we've included four floors. The not building, much the same. Uh, air and units, uh, controls, um, lighting, lots of refrigeration as well. Improvements for refrigeration uh, facilities. Building envelope improvements. Queen Street, is there anything here that is uh, it's pretty much consistent with the other buildings. It's really just taking a look at that full um, conversion of from a you know, full pneumatic control temperature control to a variable direct control. Yep. So Warren Street, same. slide we have. Um, this, this shows you generally the cost of these projects. I'm going to let Alicia speak to them uh, briefly and then we'll go questions. Thank you, Dr. Kensha. So this chart really just summarizes both the medium capital project um, and it does a breakdown per building of what the estimated costs are 
uh, based on the scope of work and the information that we have today. These plus are preliminary, and of course, as we refine the scope of work and design development, those costs will become much more finer um, to where we expect actual costs to be at this time. Um, but you can see through the medium project on the left, um, for instance, Pleasant Avenue, we're estimating about $5.6 million of work um, based on the $15 million project, about $414,000 at Lee Street, $3.6 at Lawrence Street, and so on. Um, the authorization that we're asking for on the 15th is a project not to exceed $15 million. So again, as Dr. Crankshaw mentioned, we cannot spend any more than what the voters authorize us to spend. But this two-year process, we feel comfortable with the scope of work that we've developed so far that the $15 million project will suit all the needs based on the priorities we've established through our facilities committee, audit budget finance, working as a team, um, but also with input and feedback from the Board of Education. Um, Dr. Crenshaw did mention, you know, when we get, um, once we receive voter approval and we work with the team in design development and we come up with the plans and specs, there's the submittal to the State Education Department. They have their own process of review. They a lot of times come back with questions, needs for clarification. Once that's approved, we will go out to bid for our prime contracts associated with construction. And if you recall, the construction start date was in the summer, spring, summer of 2024. So it's quite a bit of a lengthy process to get even from referendum through to when we can actually begin construction and all of you and the rest of our community can see work actually happening on our facilities. Um, so we are aided at about 92.2%. Um, I do want to mention uh, a caveat with that. So when we work on our long-range financial plan and we estimate what we expect to receive in state aid based on the cost of construction as well as other incidental costs, um, we average about 95% of the total cost will be allowable by the state to be aided. So I just want to be clear with that. When we do our projections, it's based on the fact that 95% of the total cost of this project will be aided at 92%, which I think is important for all of us to be aware of and, and to know that. Um, but part of our work for the last year and a half as long on the other side of the finance has been doing a lot of long-range modeling. Um, as Dr. Crankshaw mentioned, we're really looking 10 to 15 years in the future. And, and that's our academic, that's our capital plan, but that's our financial plan. You know, with the goal of looking at stability and consistency over the long term. Um, and, and how does this project and how we finance this project, what does debt look like? What does the receipt of aid look like? How does that ultimately impact our financial plan? And where can we better influence that impact to maintain a stable financial plan over the long term? So a lot of analysis from the financial side has been done over the last year and a half and really is an ongoing process. Even when we do sort of developing the annual budget, um, we're always looking at the long view and not just the short view in terms of making recommendations that the board will ultimately approve. Um, our aid is generated over 15 years so that the way that we would um, finance this project is really looking at when we would receive the aid back based on the work that happens, and we would align our debt schedule um, to that aid to minimize impact. Um, with the EPC, so as Bill mentioned, there's no additional impact on a tax levy based on how we've lined up our debt to the receipt of aid. I should also mention that as existing debt from our former, cap former capital projects falls off, that's when we look, we look to replace that debt. So basically, as debt falls off our books, we're adding debt back on so that we don't have the increased debt level um, that we haven't had previously. So that keeps it at a no additional impact on our tax levy. With the energy performance contracts all the way to the right, you can see with Pleasant Avenue right now, our cost estimates um, project about a $95,000 cost for Pleasant Avenue about 340,000 at Glebe, and you can see most of the energy performance contract work is at our junior senior high school. 
um, based on the scope of work and the cost analysis that we at the East team have developed through that energy study um, and their own analysis work, um, which we're still refining. So right now you'll see, even though we're asking for a not to exceed $3 million EGC project, where we stand currently based on the estimates today, we're at about a two and a half million dollar project. Now over the next couple of weeks, especially once we move past the referendum, again, we've taken in a harder look at the scope of work and refine our costs. And I know specifically with EPC projects, another requirement is this is highly New York State regulated when it comes to these projects. So there's conditions that um, an energy company has to meet, including sitting down with us as the district and thoroughly reviewing the cost analysis, um, what the guaranteed savings each year looks like, um, and all as well as meeting all the contractual terms that are really um, prescribed by New York State. Uh, so it is a highly regulated project when it comes to EPC projects. And really, if the energy savings alone with a payback period of 18 years really pays for the project. Um, so we get, as you saw, the really scope of work on the slides and on the pamphlet in front of you, all the work that we describe at each of our buildings for the EPC project, not only are we gaining um, energy efficient systems and lighting and controls over, the, over those systems, but really through that guaranteed annual savings pays for the project over 18 years. Um, so one of the things that we'll do moving forward as part of our financial plan, we're going to track those energy savings each year, right? Because as Ian mentioned, they carry the risk. So we do our own financial modeling to make sure that we're hitting those numbers on an annual basis and that this project is truly being offset by those savings over that 18 year period. Um, just a couple things just to um, reiterate is that, again, um, you know, really looking at how our property tax cap is a big factor in maintaining a stable financial plan over time and not seeing years where we would be put in a position of either swings, volatile swings, up and down, but we're going out to meet our, our annual budget needs. Part of the capital planning and how debt and aid work really does influence that calculation. So we've done a lot of work around that type of modeling as well, really to leave no stone unturned. We really <coughs> examine every type of financial impact to our financial plan and those calculations for tax levy that are prescribed by law too. There's a very um, prescribed formula that districts need to follow in New York State. So, and that statement right there, no additional impact on a tax levy, it's, it's confusing to a lot of people. A lot of people are coming up to me and are thinking that this is not going to affect their tax system. Yet, based on our long-term planning, you know, it will affect their tax system. They're still going to pay for it. Like they're still yeah. paying the 7 to 8%. They're still debt. They're still, they're still debt, debt. Yeah. Yes. We're still budgeting debt, but no additional debt. Um, I, I want to ask uh, Bill if he has anything he'd like to say or to do. You don't have to, but if there's anything you've done. No, just to, just to reiterate, um, current construction does these projects around the state, and this project definitely is not a new auditorium, so we're not raising a roof on the gym. It seems to be very, mostly for health and safety, a healthy building, safety of students. The type of thing that you own this many buildings that in the years you're going to have these sort of requirements to own these buildings made decisions and so forth, and that really is sort of fundamentally what, what, what this project is about. You may or may not know, but Bill is a alumni of the state, so, which is nice, so it's kind of nice to have him on the board. Ian, yeah, is there anything that you'd like to say that we missed? Or? No, I think the last piece um, that Alicia touched on was the measure of verification piece of, of this project, so um, when she mentioned that we're, we're um, you know, confirming that the
So the one thing I would add is something that Dr. Crenshaw um, spoke to at the beginning, that there's been a lot of planning and preparation going into this project. It's really been years in the making, um, starting with the facilities evaluation with the model involved in it, um, and then uh, very careful financial planning, and also um, educational planning too, but the project aligned with our educational goals. So um, it's really exciting to be a part of the project that's so well thought through. Um, was an Andrew Bullock or Nathan <laughs> So Johnstown has been through a lot. And so when I when I came on board three years ago, I knew that. But I also knew that we had to get our financial house in order. And I think the board had already set really good goals, uh, realistic goals for how to accomplish that. And I've just tried to keep my nose to the grindstone and think about what we do today, how it affects years from now. Alicia is very well versed in finances. We're lucky to have a good team right now. Um, we've had so much change over, over the last decade especially, but we need to be done with experiments. You know, that's why when we're talking about financing projects and things, we don't want to end up in a place seven years from now where we have to read in the papers that we get a 50% tax cut again. But these capital projects all play into that. Maintaining our buildings, improving our buildings, nothing great, like, but infrastructure type things, really important. We need to say what we need to do, and we need not to be afraid to say what we need to do. Um, I think we have the right partners, we have the right people in place. Um, so now I think it's about making a promise to our community that they support this. Children's excellent education. That's really all we want. So we've got to keep the vision in mind too. The vision is we want to be the natural choice for people in the region to send their kids to school. That's really the ultimate vision uh, in my opinion. And we are doing this through thinking through the facilities, the community, the family, the planning, staffing, politics, uh, safety, systems. So navigating all these and leveraging what we can to make. Again, this is just to get voter approval uh, to move forward to the design stage. The dollar that we get here may not, in fact, be exactly what we spent. We may spend less. We will not spend more, but we may spend less. Um, and again, the board will be involved all about every step of the way. With that, I'd like to just open it up for any questions you might have or along the way. With that. And you, you can ask questions. It's that system that is antiquated and that we don't know if it's going to work from one performance to the next. And that therein lies the problem I think Jay and I have been doing this, at least. With, with Knox, it's just a terribly antiquated system. If we don't try to upgrade it now, I'm not sure. Our next capital project isn't until 2028. And had, we're just trying to plan ahead for the use when, of the When we talk about the, the lighting in Knox, we're basically talking about switches. Yeah. Nothing more elaborate. I guess if I ask the question a bit more pointedly, why do we care if we have a functioning theater or a building requirement? Well, the goal is <laughs> the goal is uh, just move the production to the to the one. It depends on the, how the board votes. Depends on how the public agrees or disagrees. But we hope to open that building for instruction, full instruction, and opening that building to full 
construction, but it's also a community resource. I mean, that art, we don't have a million auditoriums, and I'm not saying it's used a lot, it's not. But I'm not really talking about a state-of-the-art system like a Broadway theater. We're really talking about some basic structures. We're, we don't plan on putting, um, but you know, it's still mercury lighting in the house. It just seems like, to me, that you can put all your productions on the one working stage. That way, you can kind of sort of... You could, definitely. But the, <laughs> the problem with Knox, though, we did, up to just two or three years ago, use that for performances and high school school. You don't want to let the facilities go to a point where you don't, where they don't function properly. And again, we're not looking at Cadillac systems. We're looking at just upgrading mercury lighting. We still have a foot light at Knox. You know, the truth is, we're not using that right now. The truth, the absolute That's the point I'm getting. You're not wrong. Given the population of the area's trends, it means I don't see us ever needing a second. 2031, we're looking at dropping about 150 kids. And that's, the, the scale of that decline doesn't tell me that we should be worried about closing buildings you know, I think whatever facility you have, I just believe is going to need to take care of them. But again, that, this is up for discussion. So that piece is a really good point. And don't take that negative enough because there's a lot in that project and that was the only thing I saw. Yeah. That we are literally not using that auditorium for the performance that's going on. If the system's antiquated, we ever get to the point where we do want to use it, if something great happens, like um, Amazon makes us the world headquarters and all of a sudden we have well, who knows? I, I'm, I'm just just trying to plan for whatever may happen. But is there anything else you want to say about that? It's, I think I'm right in saying we're not looking for Cadillac systems. We're looking for systems that just function at the most basic level. Simple programming, but it's the house lights. I do think we're going to use that space. Uh, I have a state where all the improvements that you guys all work together very well. As an outsider who's a New York State resident, when you tell me that I don't have to pay for it because it's state able, you take it out of the left pocket instead of the right pocket. It's I know you've heard that before because I've told you that. I say it all the time. It, but I'm also I'm, I'm still paying for it. Yes. Right? If I could respond to that, Jeff, I, again, I think you're very wise to say a lot of your things. But I have to say, it's the system. And I don't want other it's offered, it's something we leverage. I don't want to see other schools using it to build their college halls, but we just decline. So I mean, I guess we're just taking advantage of it, and it is one pocket to the other, but it, it is a, it, it's a distribution, at least, you know, that's not all on our thing. Because we're all paying our tax, taxes. And that goes more to the reason why I actually The performance contract, like to me, that seems like an awful lot of money to insulate some things and change some laws. And I realize we're only seeing about that, but we're talking about 18-year payback on some fair handles on the roof. What's their expected life? 20 years. Um, so it's it's a lot of money for what I see is not a huge gain. Furthermore, if Ian's company is guaranteeing anything, they are not doing that for free. They are taking the price to guarantee that because we don't we don't build a company with over 700 employees and no presidents and vice presidents by losing money on these guarantees. So it seems like that may be something that Uh, I'll just say from the all the projects built from the utility costs that you're probably going to spend on a handful of basis, you know that's the biggest sum of the project. So if you are going to spend those costs, you can bring those utility costs down and increase the energy efficiency of your project just straight by doing so. And that's our point. And that's what we're presenting in the position. So. Right, but my point is if, if we make all those changes without this company, we will save more 
Right? If we save $100 a year because of changes you've made, mm -hmm. if we did it ourselves and we save $100 a year, this company is going to save 10 bucks. So, the only thing I can tell you is that the what are we getting for for paying them to assume that risk? Are we getting anything in? I don't know. I think we are, but I, I just want to say something before we go deeper. We have a three million dollar project and a fifty million dollar project. The, the voters locally couldn't sustain the tax increase that would result from eighteen million dollar project. So we were just trying to leverage this at what that. Combined with a much larger project, we wouldn't have the grants and all the other things to go along with it. It's actually carefully crafted to make it so it pays for itself. And if it was an 18 million dollar project, not a 15 to 3, it would end up being increased in tax budget as well. So we're trying to mitigate that as well. So it's 17 million and 17 million. If you split it into what the cost is, it's still 17. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so the scope of the project includes the um, building controls, the automated building control system, and HVAC equipment. So I, I want to just um, sort of point out that that's very important work. Um, it's more than just the changing the light bulbs and you know coffee breaks. So um, the other thing that I'll offer is that. You're right, there's a cost to bringing a contractor in that's making a guarantee. Um, but there are some savings associated with doing the EDC project as well, because when a large capital project by state law we're required to bid for each prime contract separately, so we can't go like at the front end and, and get out from scratch. Whereas for an EDC project, it's a single prime. There's a generic cost associated with the Wix law building the project with separate primes. Um, there's some good research out there um, that can drive costs up in general by about 10%. And you're seeing no savings in the EDC project because it's a single prime project. So there's a little bit of an offset um, in, in that regard. For us, we're trying to maintain the maximum project we can get. And this was.
this when you were the actual saving? At the time we were interviewing the companies, yes. But we haven't read into the contracts for other schools. We would just look at the scope of the project, the savings, they're obviously success stories. Well, yeah, yeah. so what, what I'm looking at here, though, is how far is the guarantee away from the actual? Right? So, and it works both ways. If they were always missing, We all agree that's probably not the case. If they're always guaranteeing they're going to save 50 bucks, and the savings is always 100 mm -hmm. they're not going to trust it. So it's a, it can work so both ways. ways. I'll chime in on that, Joe. So, um, so Tim Tech's going to be the architect and engineer for the EPC project as well, the design and the engineer. We've mm -hmm. done um, upwards of 35 EPC projects, so we are in EPC experience. And um, I am always one to a little smaller EPC project that generates additional savings that go to the district. So it's, I wouldn't characterize that as a miss, I characterize that as conservative planning to make sure that some of the extra savings actually come into the district's um, general fund. I, I also employ this as a superintendent. I, I usually, it's now encouraged to raise your hand, it's my third EPC guy. Because it is, I'm with you. It's not free money, nothing's free, but it is additional money beyond the debt that we know we can budget for. It's additional improvements we can make that are significant to the learning environment that we don't have to worry about having the taxpayers pay for. Well, the local taxpayers pay for it, right? And there is a contract, so I feel good about that. And Dan Bolton is a really good one of that, as we had interview. He did a few reference checks, and so I feel I was also to what you mentioned earlier is that when EPC projects came out probably 15 years ago and we didn't think of business as another source of getting work done and garnering some savings, um, we kind of looked at these in the arena and all the refunds that we could meet those highly administrative that they were. So, <laughs> so I know, I know, but I think, you know, as much as we talk about all of these stuff and the layers that we go through and we determine funds and conditions and our meeting of contractual obligations, we we do have that layer in New York State and I'm telling you that any company as an escrow, if Dan Clark wasn't performing part of the rules and regulation, they would be barred from even providing any performance contracts to New York State. So, it's another layer of support that we know that anybody that's still working in New York State schools in terms of energy performance contracting, they have to meet those New York State requirements um, and all the funds they've met to this point in terms of cost analysis per item, determining contra contractual guarantee of savings, sitting down with us, I mean, that's all obligated by the state that they have worked on the district. So I just offer that as well, but it is a highly on top of what the State Education Department already did use this as a capital project for aid purposes. So you have that dual level of control at the state level as well. You and I are more alike than you think, but I would say too, you and I are a lot I think so too. But in my notes, I actually specifically intentionally put, we are working within the systems we have to budget. That's really important. Well, we may not agree with the system, we may not know in New York State, you know, it, it is where we are and it's what we're trying to work with. And we're trying to maximize the benefits that come from that. And if we're not going to do it, I can guarantee you, Burrell and Burke is doing it, and Portland is doing it, all the other schools next to us. And while they continue to improve, we don't want to run into shit. So we're just trying to leverage and maximize the systems of the whole. Any other questions? Uh, 
um, on a practical basis. So when, for example, at Pleasant Avenue, we're replacing the boilers, those are the basement. Are you also replacing the actual units in the classrooms? Yes. Okay, does that, does that mean you just select a classroom to be controlled? No. So it's two in that. That would be the other one. Oh. So that would be like when you're not used, it would automatically go up. So beyond which, beyond which is in the, in the hallways, it would also occur in the classrooms? I believe so, yes. Things are in the hallways, and I would say the large group areas, like the library. Thank <laughs> you. 